morning today. Um, now it's getting late in the day, so it's really, really awesome to see you here. So this session, we're going to be looking at building a microscope. Okay, so the, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Alan. Um, I run a dev company now for the last 12 years. We build stuff for food, um, which pays us. I'm also what's known as a Microsoft MVP, um, not minimal viable product, although sometimes it's, it happens. Um, that's in Internet of Things and, of course, um, dev technologies as well. Um, also part of the community, the Microsoft community in South Africa, so you're welcome to join those groups. I somehow became admin of Raspberry Pi South Africa as well. So please do join that community, it's quite huge. Okay. Right, so who attended my talk last DevConf? Oh, not many, but I'm going to report back. My farm is still going strong. Um, we've moved on now to soil science and improving the soil quality, but that's going to be a talk for another time. Okay, so what this talk is about is about how I built a microscope. So what we see here is a microscope, and also the more important part, why I built one, um, how we can also use AI for um, accessibility, improving the usability of applications. You can also get the parts as well. I'm not going to give it to you, but you can go find the parts and where to buy them as well. So it'll be like a parts list that you can, you can access as well. Also, have fun building these things. My motto is always, like, the best way to learn is to build things and have fun while doing it as well. And hopefully this is, will inspire you to build something accessible as well using all these tools that, that's at our disposal. Okay, so I, I built a microscope. Like, why, right? So why not is always my answer, right? It's cool, right? It's something, something that we need to do, something we need to build. But seriously, why, right? right? When did they start making things so small, right? So these are little electronic components. I remember a few years ago they were bigger, right? So um, things to me are getting smaller and smaller, right? As you get older, you, your focus and stuff sees things smaller, right? I work on lots of IoT projects, so, so it's either hobby projects, commercial projects, or just having fun, so they're doing a lot of this stuff, right? So my current workflow is like this, right? I see this little chip that I've got here, and then I bring out a magnifying glass and have a look at it, squint a lot, um, and then I bring out something like this, which is quite nice because it's in hands-free, I can wear it on my head, and then what happens is I do have the advantage of looking insanely cool when wearing it, right? So, so that's, that is a byproduct of that thing, right? Right, so there must be a better solution, right? So we've got this little, this little thing, let's make it bigger, right? So that's a better solution, right? So we can now see the thing bigger, I can read it, I can, I can read it in both screens here, which is pretty cool, so that's better, right? But what we can do is make it even better, right? So I don't have to read it, right? I can get technology to read it for me. And there we've got it annotated on, a, on it. For those that don't know what that thing is, that's a transistor. So it would also be very cool to ask it um, what that is, right? And we could get a, a description from it as well. So that's a better solution, right? So what to do? So I could have written a letter and posted it to electronic companies to make these things bigger for me, but that's not going to happen, right? So the only, th only thing to do is build a solution. So, so this is all about how I solve the problem um, of accessibility for myself, right? So this is, this is Helios, um, the smart Helios microscope, so meet on. Helios. Helios Chat, how are you? So what we have, voice recognition, goes to a chat window, querying a AI model, large language model, getting a response back. Hello, I'm Helios, the intelligent microscope. I'm here to help with all your microscopic needs and accessibility in the electronics industry. How can I assist you today? And here's a little joke for you. Why did the electron go to school? 
because it wanted to get a little more positive. Grinning face with smiling eyes. So that's one thing that AI is not going to replace, is not comedians. <laughs> right. So what's happened now is voice trigger Leo's for blind. switching on the, the actual microscope, right? So it's visualizing a blank space. Voice command to switch lights on. So we've got the lights that's switching on. So here's an example here, physically, of the lights that we got. Helios brightness 100. Right. Voice commands, parameters as well. We can, we can make it seriously bright. And notice there on the screen as well, you can then start seeing the visibility. It's not this, right? This is pre-recorded. <laughs> so so um, for those that's wondering there, uh, this, this was recorded. I wasn't going to try all these intricate things in a demo. Right, so this is me tuning the, the, the actual microscope and focusing it in. So there we're pulling something into focus. This board that we're looking at is a Gigatron. It's a, a processor built out of individual components. There isn't a microcontroller on it, just for interest. Helios rotate. OK, so there's voice command there. It's actually rotating the picture because it looks better in 90 image. degrees. This is all cool because it's like hands-free. OK. Right. I think I see oh. a close-up of a circuit board. The text I read was 74 HCT 157. So what we've got there, it read the component on the, or the text on the board, annotated it, and sent it to a large language model, describe what it is, and now it's sent the actual component to the language the stock model, item you are and now we're getting a description of it. SN 74 HCT 157. It is an electronic IC manufactured by Texas Instruments. More the information SM74 about it. The SM seventy four HCT one fifty seven is a quad two input multiplexer with three state outputs. It is commonly used for data selection and routing applications. It operates at a voltage supply range of four point five V to five point five V. You can that's find being read it in the electronic well. ICs cool. category. Location. Shelf A2. It's bin telling one. me where to Here's find it you. in my Why did electronics electron shop, right? So therapy. on which shelf, because which bin to go find it in as well. So it's, so it's now also enabling me to find stuff. It's also got me to categorize all my electronic components. It used to be in a big box, but now this has forced me to put it on different shelves in different bins. So, this, so it's also trained me to do stuff. Cool, that's cool. Right, so what Helios does is gives me hand-free operation. It has natural language, so I can speak to it. I can give it commands as well. It also has speech generation, so it can speak back to me as well. So I don't necessarily have to type. I don't necessarily have to go tap on a screen and things like that as well. It's linked to my stock management. It allows me to zoom with mechanics and things like that. It's got built-in lighting that we have there. It's got vision can read the things for me, so I don't have to. It also remote streams, and it helps me improve the quality of my electronics work, right? Soldering and things like that. Right, the reason why it's Helios, Helios is involved in light, right? So for Greek mythology, which is to do with seeing, but Helios was a dude, right? So I changed it to a, a she and her pronoun, right? So, so my Helios is female. So in quality control, right, we, you look at these PC boards, and it's nice to inspect them, right, because these PC boards are really small. So looking at the soldering work that you've done is really, really important to see that they're good joints and things. And what we could do is also identify bad joints in soldering as well. I do a lot of those, <laughs> so this is really important um, to help me with that type of problem as well. So everything here is built around the conversational design. So you basically can speak to it, either by typing, voice commands as well, It'll query the stock system. Um, and then, of course, it uses visual and capabilities as well. I can ask it about my stock specifically. So what, what we've done here is asked about Raspberry Pi. I have many Raspberry Pis in stock, and I can get more information about it. It also has context as well. So, so there it's going to say, well, I've got a list of Raspberry Pis. 
There's many, right? Which one do you want to know about? So we can ask, in this case, about a Raspberry Pi 4. And then it'll tell me specifically about it and also where to find it, which is important. It also helps me with losing things as well. Right, so it's also built with a command interface, so we've got a list of commands that we can do. It's important to have these commands, or, or the, as, the most important one is that speech command, that we don't want this thing listening to everything that we're saying, right, and, and doing weird random things. So like Google and Siri well, well, um, has command words, our microscope has that too, so it's, so it's really cool. Right, so digital microscopes, not unique. You get all these Tomloff microscopes as well that you can buy, but they don't do all the other features and stuff that I wanted to do, right? So I didn't get one of these. I did get one of these. This is also off-the-shelf ones, but it doesn't, all the software, just Wi-Fi camera things. So, so what, what this solution here with the Raspberry Pi is, you can customize it to do whatever you want. I did build an interface, though, that streams from that to the same user interface as well. That's, that you can do via USB. Right, so this needed to be fast, simple to use, um, allow for hands-free operation. I wanted it to be modular because I wanted to do weird and wonderful experiments, not just what I'm showing you here as well, and it needed to support constrained devices, not anything more than a Raspberry Pi 3, because I've got lots of those and wanted to use it. I didn't want to make an AI cluster and run models and stuff on the device. I wanted to be constrained as well. I think the term is now cluster duck, right? <laughs> right. So the imaging is at the edge, but the AI is in the cloud. Okay, this is a hobby project that I use every day of my life. So terms and conditions apply, <laughs> right? So, but it is a hobby project. Okay, so there's quite a lot of hardware in this. So we've got Raspberry Pi. Um, it actually supports all the major, all the B boards. So from the top, Raspberry Pi 3, 4, and 5. So for those that don't know, it's a low-cost um, single board computer. Interfaces with hardware, runs, in this case, it's running as a Linux operating system as well, but you can run other things as well. Right, I also have Pi Zeros involved in this project. Pi Zero is a now very, or really low-cost solution. Um, it also uses very little power as well. It's also nice and small. It's also really cheap, which is the best part of it. Right, so the camera itself is what's known as a Raspberry Pi, high quality camera board. Um, it's 12 megapixels, which is pretty cool. But what's really nice about these camera modules is it's got CS mounts. So you can put serious lenses on it and you can use the standard CS mount lenses too. So what I'm using is the industrial microscope lens. It only gives like, it's not a earth shattering magnification. 100 times, but 100 times is over enough for what I'm doing. I don't want to go look at the molecules inside the electronics. I want to just see the text bigger as well. You do get higher magnification lenses as well. What's cool about this lens, it's got a little twisty thing that you can turn, and then the twisty thing makes it focus as well. So, so you can then pull focus and things like that. So it's a really nice lens as well, also not too expensive. Okay, the little display that you see there is a five-inch display. It works with all the, the B boards. Um, it's got a case built in as well. And what's nice is it's got adapters where you notice that you've got the board at the back, the, the Raspberry Pi board, an adapter for the three, and of course the four and five uses the same adapter as well. It's nice to have a little display like that that's also touch, touch sensitive as well. Right, or you can use any display, right? I've got another version of this running a Waveshare 7 inch. The lighting that you see here is a unicorn hat from Pimeroni. It uses the WS2812 um, LED implementation. So it's basically just a, like a, who uses RGB LED strips, right? This is just LED strips in a square. So they're all. It goes in basically a serial cycle that you've got there. You've got 64 of them. Um, and behind that, this is where the Raspberry Pi Zeros come in. Um, they basically just attach to the back, right? So it makes it a nice, compact, easy-to-use solution. And I send message to it via MQTT. 
right? So I can switch them on, switch them off, and all those type of things. Right, so what we have here is just a camera, <laughs> like a demo. These lights are harsh, <laughs> so, so you, at 100% brightness, you do not want to look at them. But what we've got here is the bright, just, a, just an example of, let's just go back to that, of stepping up the brightness one step at a time. On the left side is it looking at an ESP32 board, so you can see the steps in brightness, so it's pretty cool. And then no IoT-related talk is complete without RGB lights, right? So it can be any color you want as well. So, so the talk is now complete, <laughs> right? Okay, so we had a design in the beginning, which was just using little crocodile clips um, of putting the board on little, these little paper post-it note holders. I thought that was a great idea. But then seeing that I'm at a fancy conference, 3D printed the casing for it as well. But what I actually now do is put the little 3D case on the crocodile clips. <laughs> They're nice to position. Okay, right. So the audio, um, these USB um, sound cards are really cool. Take note, Dale. They work really, really nicely with any operating system, right? It works for Windows, and even better, it works for Linux, and it gives you no issues whatsoever. And it's also got a nice connector for these speakers as well. Okay. Right, so the stand, this is the original stand that I have here. Not as fancy as the one that I'm going to show you here. So the stand that I've got can allow the vertical movement of the microscope. So it's got a little knob that you, that you turn and you can slide it up and down. It also has the horizontal movement as well, so you can move things. Um, if you've got like a big board and stuff, you can slide it out, which is quite nice as well. And it's got the normal microscope adjusters like that just does the fine movement as well. So, so these Microsoft microscope stands are really, really useful for positioning the lens and things. So basically you can extend it fully like that and you can move it right down depending on what you're looking at and what you need to focus on. The architecture that we have here, we've got Azure Cosmos DB. Um, it's running MongoDB, um, the vCore version. Um, we're using Azure AI Vision, Azure OpenAI, and Azure AI um, Speech as well. The core of the application that you see, that over there is a very tiny version of it, is Avalonia, um, Avalonia UI, which is the .NET UI framework. And all the messaging that we do here is using Mosquito, right? So Mosquito, MQTT. The lights connect to the MQTT bus, and we've got some other, which I'm not going to show you, remote controls from, from mobile apps, and some adaptive controllers as well. Right, so internally, there's like a messaging architecture. So what we've got is lots of messages that we can pass, which is things like the capture, of the, of the image, the changing the light brightness, um, things like rotate, like you saw in the example where you rotate the picture. So it's a messaging architecture, which is quite cool because then it also supports, I've got now the, the UI support for, for tapping on it. I've got support for voice as well, and I've got support as well for um, uh, MQTT messages that come in as well. So I can then remote control this from another device too. Okay, so this is using Raspberry Pi. These camera stacks. So there's something known as a legacy camera stack, which was multiple libraries of things um, and utilities with varying APIs. Um, had things like Video for Linux 2. Um, it had a, and it uses like command line utilities like Raspberry Still and Raspberry Vid. Then there's the new lib camera stack, high performance, interacts with the kernel directly. Um, it's a unified camera stack, right? So it's the new way of working. There's core libraries that you can get to, all the fundamentals of the cameras as well, which is cool. And you've got the command line utilities, which is basically lib um, vid, lib still to take pictures or take videos and things like that. Okay, so. We have this configuration within the Raspberry Pis where we have the option to switch between the legacy camera and the new camera stack. 
Right, so it gives you the option like this. So what I've been doing all the years, right, when using these, these solutions, is going enable legacy stack. Yes, because why, why do we want change, even though those, those features here are pretty cool? Always went yes to that question. And then I went, well, let's make this work on a Raspberry Pi 5 and 64-bit bookworm, which is the latest um, Raspberry Pi operating system. How hard could that be, right? Then I went into the same <laughs> um, Raspberry config, and they took away the, the support to make the legacy camera stack work, right? So the support's gone, right? And <laughs> my application went boom, right? Apologies for that um, picture. Um, I was AI generating pictures, and it wouldn't allow me to generate an explosion. So that's my explosion <laughs> text. Okay, so we had the nice facility in the .NET world, IoT device media, which allowed us to get camera frames and things. Gone. It actually works, but it gives you garbage, right? So that's gone. And then... Um, going through um, lots of GitHub issues and things like that with Microsoft. They were toing and froing on how to make this work within their own IoT libraries and things, and they got a solution <laughs> up and running in November <laughs> to make this work. But the solution is we're going to spawn libcamera, which is an executable. We're going to pass it some parameters, and then what we're going to do is capture the standard output of that and that's how we're going to stream, right? Um, sounds like a bad idea, right? Um, weirdly enough, because Linux is cool, it works really nicely on Linux. That on Windows would be horrible, right? So, um, but that's the solution that they've got there. Um, so my plan, and I'm still busy with it, is to complete the C bindings and make it bind directly, but it's a huge amount of work. So this solution here is using my own version of spawning the, the lib camera and capturing standard output as well. Okay, so there's a, this is microscope stack. It's using a lot of stuff. The UI that we see is Avalonia, which is a free open source .NET UI um, framework. It has full Linux support, so if you're a .NET developer and you want to go for Linux, that's probably your best option, right? So it is really, really powerful. Um, it's, a, it's got nice support for embedded development, and you can also make it output directly to Linux frame buffer. So if you want nice dashboard 60 frames a second and stuff, it is freaking cool, right? So, so that's, if you want to do like dashboarding little kiosk apps and stuff with Linux, it is really, really powerful. It is fast and small, um, so that we use it for lots and lots of IoT applications. Yeah, it also has a nice design interface. It's got a live preview and things. Um, you could do your, your screens in C-sharp, or you can do it in XAML. Um, and here we see that we've got the same, same type of experience on Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Who uses Visual Studio? Who uses Visual Studio Code? Who uses C-sharp? OK. Who's going to use C-sharp after this talk? Oh, it's less. Ah! <laughs> right. Okay, so, so what we have is basically a model view, view model implementation. Um, I've def designed my views and stuff in XAML. What's really cool about this, and the reason why we're using Avalonia, it works on Linux and Windows. Right, so I can run the same microscope on Windows, and what I can do is stream the microscope content from there to my machine as well, which is quite cool. With, with this implementation as well, you compile your, your, your binaries, C sharp, to, to ARM binaries, so it's an ARM device. You can also do cool things like remote debugging, because Raspberry Pis, not incredibly fast to compile with. The Raspberry Pi 5 is, is OK. But any version before that, compiling and stuff is ridiculously slow. So what's nice is build your app on Windows and then remote deploy to your Pi. Um, I use WinSCP to do the remote copy because it does a diff as well from the DLLs that copy across. And then you can use the Visual Studio remote debugger to work, which, which is really awesome. And then you can run in Windows and, and see what's happening on your Pi. 
Yeah, so lots of services in code using dependency injection. I made it like that so I can plug out things and plug in other cool things as well. Um, so it's a nice pluggable interface as well. Okay, so what we're doing to get the camera images to display, um, we're streaming the, the output of the camera. Um, I'm use, I chose MJPEG for the streaming. Of course, why? If you look at this implementation here, it must have taken the, the JPEG group years to come up with this solution to make motion JPEG, right? So what they've done here is have a start, which is basically an FF and a D8. They put a JPEG in it, and then they ended it off with a D9, right? And they just repeat it, right? So, so that implementation, right, must have taken a massive design team to come up with. But the reason why I used it is it's really easy to write a decoder, right? You just look, if statement makes it work, right? And we can take the lib camera, tell it to do MJPEG, and then just capture the frames coming out of it, which is pretty cool. Right, so it's nice and easy. I do plan to make a H.264 decoder, but it's severely more complicated. But at the moment, MJPEG works from the, on the device, because you don't worry about network bandwidths and things like that. Right, so what you can do is spawn the process. We get an event that happens when we capture the frame, and the source of that in the, in the direct implementation is the standard output, right? So in other words, run lib camera, get its standard output. Also implemented, okay, and then of course I take the output of that, which is a picture, the JPEG, and then just tell Avalonia, this is your picture to display. Right, so that's, that's nice for device, or same device to same device. Then I implemented another, version of it, pretty much the same thing, but it just uses the TCP stream. So I can then stream across the network as well. Okay, so it's just a TCP client, same code to get the frames out of it, and then the source in that case wasn't standard out, it was the TCP stream. Okay, and then we have a linear picture. This is really cool if you want to use VLC to look at the output, or, or use a Helios app on your machine. Okay, so what we did was we used vision, reads the text on the PC board, captions, we got speech, which is voice recognition, verbal command, speech analysis, and then of course for open AI is for the conversational interface. Right, in open AI we can then deploy our own models, so I'm using GPT-3.5, why? Because it's damn cheap. So, so that model is also good enough for what I need to do, and we're using an embedding as well. Okay, so, so using OpenAI is really easy. You've got a .NET um, SDK, it's got a client, and what you do is basically give it an endpoint and a key, and off you go, right? I'm using what's known as RAG for the querying to my stock control system, so it's retrieval augmented generation. So what that does, gets embeddings using the embedding model. Um, it does a vector search against my MongoDB, um, using the embedding, and then gets a chat completion out of chat GPT, right? So that gives me the stock levels that I've got, right? So just have a closer look at how that works. We're getting an embedding, uses the, I'm using the adder embedding model that's, that's available within Azure um, OpenAI. And what we can do there is getting the embedding. So embeddings, right? Um, it's basically getting characteristics, um, similar characteristics in a mathematical space, um, and, and literally working at vector distances between them, and of course that infers how close the characteristic is to what you're looking up. Right, so the vector search, who uses MongoDB? Nobody, but that's how you query from MongoDB, <laughs> right? Right, and what we're doing there is we're actually looking up the embedding. So you know, see there that the open, the open view there, that's, that's one stock item I've got. It's a stock item of a sound chip that I've got in stock, but it's got the embedding, right? So it's the, the characteristic and similarity. Right, so completions in the, in the GPT world, completions is the result that's coming back from the model. When we ask for a completion, we pass it a system message, which is the behavior that the model needs to do, 
And of course, we also pass it that embedded document, right? That's been looked up in the vector search. So it has context of that as well. And then we choose the model. In this case, it's the GPT-35 model that we're using. And the user prompt is what they typed in. Okay, so system messages. This system message gives Helios all its behavior, right? Your name is Helios, and you introduce yourself as a, by name, and your behavior, and it maps out exactly what Helios does. So you, you describe how it works. But that text in bold is actually what makes the magic work, right? Because the document coming back is JSON, so you just tell it, go look in that JSON, and tell me, and, and based on the user questions, look up the chips in my database, which is pretty powerful stuff, right? And you can give it instructions as well, how to answer, answer it back. So this is what makes the whole intelligence work. You explain to it what to do, and it does it for you, and, and it's pretty magical, right? Okay, so we're using AI vision. So AI vision, we've got a, also a NuGet package for that. We connect to the client. There, it's as simple as passing in a parameter to say visual read, and we get like a whole structure back, which is text blocks, and text blocks have lines, and they have also the text that it sees and reads, and we also have polygons, right? So we can draw shapes based on that, right? If we ask for objects, so this also detects objects uh, as well, you just change it to tell, return me some visual objects. Different structure comes back, all the detected objects, they tag so you can see many, and each of those has a bounding box, which is x, y, and width and height. Okay, so then we can use this thing called Skia, right? So Skia is a cross-platform um, high-speed graphics library. C Sharp's got Skia Sharp. And then we can say, well, that image that we just got from our camera, what we can then do is take it, take it as a, ca a Skia canvas, we can then draw on it based on those polygons, right? So the, the, the text to read is polygons. So we can then use paths to draw polygons, and we can annotate a picture, right? So this stuff is pretty cool to do. It's giving you all that information you've got back. Who recognizes what this is? OK, you're officially old. <laughs> right, right, that's a EULA for a ZX Spectrum. Okay. Right, so we've got all the information that we need to draw the nice annotations and stuff with a, with a drawing tool, and we can read the text, so I don't have to, right? The objects have bounding boxes, simpler to draw than paths and stuff with, with um, polygons, so what we can then do is just draw a bounding box with a description of what it is. That's the description of a .NET bot. Okay, so the, the speech to text, you basically tell it, your API key is the important part, what language it needs to be in, which region, microphone setups and things. And um, what you can then do is just simply set up event handlers to say, well, you've recognized something and it gives you back the result, right? And so you get the result of a event handler and then you can do whatever you need to do with it. Okay, so if you want to do text-to-speech, in other words, the speech of Helios, um, We've got an API key in the region, and you basically give it a voice name, right? And you, you can speak, and it'll output the text, right? And then what you can also do is merge all the technologies together. Hello, Dolph. This goes good with me. A thank you. I have an intelligent microscope that is here with all the microscopes that you can use. So, 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 yeah. I can help you. So, That's a bit of a weird pronunciation of ESP32, but anyway. So, so what all I did here was I told the GPT model, you're, you must only answer in Afrikaans, and then I passed it to Adri, which, which did the reading, right? So you can mix and match these technologies together, and you can get some cool things. So think about what you could do for language translation, especially in accessible type of apps. Right, so with respect to accessibility, there's more than one billion individuals that, that's disabled. If you think about accessibility, right, 
and help the people that need it, you're actually enhancing your application, right? And you're making it easier to use, right? It's an optimal, it's an optimal situation as well, right? And um, like in my case, I built it to help me because I'm struggling to work on these things. So it solved my accessibility problems, right? So this was a selfish <laughs> accessibility app, but this is what I use to solve my problems, right? So, so that was me, and I don't need to sit with my magnifying glass anymore and then read from the chips. So hopefully this helps maybe in give you some inspiration on how to take all these technologies, mush them together, and then come up with nice accessible solutions and things like that. Right, I hope it was useful, and, and um, thank you for coming. Is there any questions? We've got four minutes. So what I'm using there for drawing is here, right? So Skia is cross-platform, and what a very cool gentleman from Cape Town did was he created a library called Skia Shop, and we're using that, right? So it uses Skia under the hood, so you can draw anywhere, right? So you can draw in Linux the same way you can draw in Windows and all platforms. It's really powerful, and it's really fast. It's, it's GPU accelerated as well. Yeah, so, so Skia Shop, I suggest you use it. You'll find uh, Avalonia uses Skia under the hood as well. Really powerful language. Yeah, the guy that works on it from Microsoft's Matthew. Um, I won't tell him I mentioned it, so don't <laughs> don't let it don't let it out. Any more questions? Was this useful? Hope we're going to get some cool accessible ideas. Um, this was just a hobby project for me to solve my own accessibility problems, but yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that one, right? So, so this, I started with playing with it and messing with it and doing things for probably two years, right? But if you had to sit and make that implementation from scratch, right, and start going on weird tangents and saying, well, I want to use different models and things like that, and I want to play with 300 different things, you can probably build that in probably a week. <laughs> right, using those AI services out of the box. So this stuff is really powerful for getting you going very, very quickly. The most complicated part was, was basically just coordinating all the messages so that I could have speech, MQTT, and a user interface involved as well. But it's really powerful stuff for building things quickly. If you, if you use the direct implementation, it's good enough to solder on a, on a Pi 3. If you use that implementation that's TCP, no, it's, got, it's too much lag, definitely. I am working on the direct translation of the C bindings that you can use the library straight, that you don't get the standard output, but, but the standard output is still good enough to actually work on it. But over the network, you, you're dead in the water. Yeah. Yeah. I mostly use it quickly across the network for just like putting a board there and then remoting it to Windows. No. No. Yeah? Yes. That's, that's cool. I, at the moment, I move the lights until it works, but, but that could work nicely, because you can... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no definitely, but yeah, I mess with the lighting and things like that. Um, you also notice in that video, in the dark, with those lights and the camera that I was using to look at it, the color's slightly off as well on those. Cool. But yes, thank you very much for coming. Um, yes, don't forget the survey. Like and subscribe. Um, and there's, yeah, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>